Welcome to the Investor Coaching Show, a podcast to help you get an insider's view of the financial world and escape common investment traps. And here's your host, Paul Winkler. All right, this is the Investor Coaching Show, and I am Paul Winkler, as excited as I can be to be here. You know, so a lot of times these past few weekends, I've been, you know, there's, there's stuff that I've been doing. So I had to do, you know, a few pre-records. I apologize. But, you know, it's always new stuff. Even when I do that, it's because I'm just, I just got to be that way. But uh, you know, it's actually me here today. Yep. Really actually sitting here this beautiful day. While some of you, Jeff include, I know, watching football, right? You're watching football. You're doing the show, but you're watching, right? Right? Where is he? So he's not even he's not even listening. I plead the fifth. Okay, Probably there you go. I wasn't distracted or anything. Uh, uh, no, you weren't. You weren't. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, funny, man. Okay, so yeah, we've got uh I've got a lot of stuff to talk about today. This has been an interesting, interesting few weeks. And uh last week especially, very interesting stuff. You know, I thought I would do some fun things here so far as the things that you know, you know, just imagine yourself in my shoes, you're a financial person, and people are trying to get your attention to get you to sell their stuff. Because you're usually what are you hearing out there? As the public, you're hearing the sales pitches from the investment advisors, right? But wouldn't it be fun to hear what the sales pitches were that the investment advisors are hearing, that they're sifting through? So, you know, I'll talk a little bit about that today. I think that's going to be fun to get into. Uh, You know, especially, and and there are a few things that have happened this week, several, several things that I can, I'm going to go back to past shows and just not necessarily, you know, I'm not going to play past shows or anything like that, but I'm just going to talk about ideas that if you've listened to the show for a while, you've heard me talk about. And I'm going to get into them. I'm going to get into some of these ideas and how all of a sudden some of this stuff is starting to happen. And I, I just think it's, it's kind of cool because, you know, a lot of times I'll step out there and I talk about changes, things that are coming about, maybe technological things that are happening. And, you know, I, go, I think this is going to be something. I think this is going to be something. And then all of a sudden it becomes something. And I want to just say, hey, look, this is what we talked about. But it often the things that I think about that are going to happen, I'm terrible at predicting the future just like anybody else. You know, and I always tell people, you don't have to be able to predict the future to be a successful investor. That is the premise of this show. I mean, literally, it's polar opposite of everything else. I, I don't know anything else out there. I don't know of any other financial you know, companies on this station, uh, companies that are doing any kind of, you know, that I, I know in this area there, I suppose there are a few that um, they're out there. I just don't know of them. But we often talk about the fact that you don't have to be able to predict the future. And, and typically they say, well, you can't predict the future. You'll hear people say that. But then you watch how they manage money and you see it's based on predictions about the future. So they're talking out of both sides. And this is something I have often said is, you know, you don't, no way, not at all. Don't try to figure out which stock is going to be better than another. You know, when you're buying and holding individual companies, you're holding them. Why? Because you think that they're going to do better than other companies like them. That's the prediction about the future. If you're holding a portfolio that is more heavily weighted in one area of the market, like has so often I've talked about here on the show, that American investors are, you know, 80, 90 percent of their portfolios in large U.S. stocks. Well, you must be betting that large U.S. stocks are going to outperform small ones, for example, or that they're going to outperform international in the future, or that they're going to outperform small value or emerging markets or something like that. And, you know, that's a bet. That, that's a prediction. Or you would be diversifying more. And typically, I, I say typically, I, I said I'm being kind, I don't ever see portfolios that well diversified across many different asset categories. And a lot of it goes back to our way of choosing investments, which is short-term past performance. So what you'll see is typically you'll see very, very concentrated portfolios in certain areas of the market. And the example that I like to give was in the late 80s when I got into this business, got my securities licenses, it was the polar opposite of what we're seeing right now. Now, right now, we see very, very concentrated portfolios in U.S. companies. Well, actually, in the late 80s, you saw 
an, an incredible le- level of concentration in international. It was the opposite. And it was, you know, the people that I was working with, the older guys that I was working with at the big insurance company, well, I can name it, doesn't matter, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company I was working for at the time when I first got my securities licenses, these guys were all telling me, Paul, congratulations on getting your securities license. Now go put all your clients' money in international stocks. Forget about U.S. because U.S. hasn't performed for two decades. And they were right. It hadn't performed well for two decades. And anybody with any sense of <laughs> any sense, let me just end the sentence there, would have probably listened to them because it seemed sensible. It seemed sensible to go after what had just done so well. And, you know, lucky for me, I was just, I, you know, I don't feel like I know enough guys to do anything is really where I stood. I didn't feel like I was well educated enough to really make recommendations to anybody about anything. So I really went down the road of doing, you know, what I thought would harm people the least, <laughs> you know, selling health insurance, selling auto insurance, selling disability insurance, long-term care insurance. You know, so I, th- those were the types of things that I sold as opposed to going where, you know, they were saying, hey, you know, you got your license now, go out and sell this stuff. You know, so, but for me, it was, I just love learning. So, you know, getting license, you go, why would you go through all that trouble to get all of those licenses to do that if you're not going to use it? It's just, I like learning. And, you know, eventually, who knows? I just gather information. And I, I talk to young people all the time. And I will say, just keep gathering information. Keep learning. Because you never know when there's going to be something that just hits you like a two by four, where you feel like you've got to do that. I've got to pursue that. And it may be something totally, as a matter of fact, I was having a conversation with my, one of my friends earlier today. We were out at a, uh, at a uh, group picnic, and he was talking about how so often, this, is a, this guy that does a lot of counseling of people for careers, and he makes a, made a comment, he said, how often people end up doing something totally different than they thought they would be doing. And how that changes. And I told him my story and said, oh, yeah, that's exactly the way I look at these things. But one of the things that happened this week was um, on CNBC. Now, the um, and I hope, Nick, that we got got the ability to play audio here. Okay, we do. Good. So what this was is, um, uh, you know, nuclear. I mean, remember a while back I was talking about nuclear power. And I was talking about how now they have this new technology. It's a lot safer. You know, it's not the old days of Three Mile Island that we talk about all the time. People make it into this boogeyman of this is terrible thing. It's going to, you know, ruin civil- civilization. Everybody's going to die and all this stuff. They have modular nuclear reactors. Very, very safe. Much smaller. Much more, much better built. Instead of building a nuclear reactor on land that, you know, you can have... Uh, inconsistencies, let me just put it that way. That's literally what they said in a lot of the articles that I read, that there'd be inconsistencies in construction. What they said was that you can make these things a lot safer. Well, it's interesting to hear how people's opinions on things just radically change when all of a sudden they have a need. And that was what this clip is right here. Check this out, what Big Tech has to say about this. Uh, for more uh, on uh, Big Tech's plans to power AI using nuclear energy, uh, we are joined right now by Mark Nelson, Radiant Energy Group Managing Director. Um, how realistic is this in terms of what does the time frame look like? Because we've been talking about nuclear for a very long time, but sort of getting it, uh, getting it right and getting it soon seems to be the bigger question. Timeline is absolutely going to be one of the fairest and first questions. I think without a doubt, we're going to see this load for new AI locked in place with whatever power plants are available as the long-term plan to deploy nuclear uh, comes to fruition. And- yeah, so this is something that is a, in huge need for running AI. They're, they're looking at this and going, how on earth do we power these computers for AI without a lot of energy? And that's what this guy is talking about. Now, this is funny because it comes from an industry that was saying, no nuclear, you know, you just stay away from it. It's terrible. It's awful. And they're going, oh, boy, it looks like we need this in order to make things work. In other words, they're going to figure out where they want to put data centers, make sure transmission is going to work, get whatever power they can available, and then build it up as along with deploying the new nuclear. But I think the bigger question is, you know, where is this stuff going to actually reside? Are they going to get the permits to do it? 
Is there going to be a whole sort of not in my backyard situation still? Has that? Yeah, that's been a big thing, right? NIMBY, not in my backyard because nobody wants this thing in your backyard. And we look at, for example, other countries around the world that have walked away from nuclear, I think prematurely. I think it has been bitten them because of the political pressure to shut this stuff down. It has actually bitten them. And I look at this and go, well, what if, what if all of a sudden you have big tech companies here in the United States? As a matter of fact, The Economist had an article this week about the United States is the envy of the world. Now, we may have lots of problems, and we do. We hear about them all the time, right? It's a political campaign season. We hear about our problems all over the place. And it's funny because you'll hear some politicians say, well, we're doing better than the other countries around the world. I says, well, yeah, because a lot of the other countries around the world are more advanced in their movement away from more pure capitalist motives, you know, so you look at how how much uh, regulation there is in other countries around the world, and you say, well, why are they having even more problems than we are? It's because they're even further down that road. But what's happening here is now we're looking at this going, hey, now they're looking over here, this side of the pond, and they're saying, hey, we're the envy. Now, this reminds me a lot. Now, I don't, you know, I'm not necessarily saying that this is a reason to change any investment portfolio strategy if the portfolio strategy is correct. Let's say that you're well diversified between U.S., international, small and large companies and value and growth and all the stuff that I talk about. But it's just worth noting that the United States was ahead of other countries around the world when we had the personal computer. And that first came out. And literally, you would have other countries around the world operating on DOS, disk operating system, right? And we were starting to use Windows ahead of them. And therefore, what happened is in the 90s, U.S. had a jump start on other countries around the world for that reason. Then later on, the international community caught up. And that's when they benefited significantly from implementing some of the same software programs and tools that we were using ahead of them in other areas around the world. Changed. It absolutely has changed. So one of the first things I would say is that. So this is the NIMBY thing, by the way. I'm Sorry, I, I interrupted. He's talking about not my backyard. He's saying, has that changed? So I'll, I'll continue. Almost every American nuclear plant was originally sized back in the 1970s and 80s for double or triple the amount of nuclear power that eventually got built with the turn away from nuclear in the 80s and 90s after Three Mile Island and Chernobyl. So existing nuclear plants have massive available transmission corridors and you don't have to get anyone's permission to add more wire to go. Seen that cool. You don't even have to get permission is what he's basically saying right here. So therefore, thereby, you know, and, and this has been a problem all the time, regulation, regulation, right? And, and you know, I talk about having your own little personal private airplane, right? You know, a, being able to have something that you can take off and, and go to work and, and fly back, you know, I love the Jetsons, right? But the biggest problem to getting that going is regulation. Over in Europe, you're having some of this happen where people are able to actually fly around various places, even China. China is a big place where this is happening. But it has been regulation that has hamstrung companies and the, the populace of being able to do these types of things. Go through it if you aren't taking any new land. Then at the nuclear plants, nuclear plants that have been operating for 30 or 40 years, now that turns into a strength because it means that everyone living around the plant knows about the plant, perhaps works at the plant, goes to schools paid for by the plants. There's a yes in my backyard that you're going to see overwhelmingly in these projects. In terms of cost and in terms of return, um, given the way the technology works right now, do you look at this sort of slate of, of big investments as, you know, major wins economically? Do they need to be tested to sort of get to the next place because there's going to be sort of, uh, you know, cost uh, issues on the first round of these? Well, this is just the beginning. That's what I'd say first. So, for example, um, this Amazon deal is much bigger than Google Seal from two days ago, but it's much smaller than Microsoft's deal from several weeks ago. So, the so, so the, you know, the, then what I wanted you to hear there is that you have major, major companies behind this. Amazon. 
Microsoft, and, and you do have Google. And of course, what's going on is now that you have these huge companies that are super, super dependent upon this coming to fruition, now you start to see things move because they've got the capital to make sure that it moves. Now, what I think is so interesting about this is prior, and this is something they mentioned later on in the interview, for like 10 years, they were against this. No, you can't do this. We can't do this. It's terrible. You, you know, we don't. And, and he says, isn't it funny how all of a sudden the attitudes have completely changed regarding the news, use of nuclear? Now, this harkens back to a while, quite a while ago, I talked about a video that I'd seen where this guy was, he was very much an environmentalist, self-proclaimed environmentalist. And one of the things that he talked about was wind power. He was talking about solar power. And he was talking about water and and taking and running water, like, you know, how you have a river, a, a hydro plant or something like that, and you're creating electricity through that means. And what this guy basically said in his video, he says, this is something I have been behind for years. And he says, I have come to the conclusion that this is no longer nearly as viable as we were sold that it, that it was, that we should be able to create a whole boatload of electricity on this. He said, I'm just no longer of that opinion. Now I'm going back. I probably saw this video. Man, I think I'm going back five to 10 years that I saw this video. Maybe not quite 10 years, but it was a long time ago. And what, had, what he said in his video, he says, I have become an advocate of nuclear for that reason. And of course, a lot of people probably try to shut him down over this because they're like, oh, you can't do that. But isn't it interesting? Now you have these big companies that have a lot of bandwidth and they have a lot of people's ears because people listen to what these people have to say. Now advocating for this. And I think this could be really, really cool because what is one of the biggest cost expenditures for corporations? It is energy. It is electricity. It is fuel to run the plants, to transport goods from here to there. And if we can have something that actually creates more energy, more cheaply and more safely, that is something that can help reduce costs and increase profitability and earnings for companies. And if you look around and you go, wow, what's going on out there? What could be going on out there? I think it'll be really interesting going forward. And I'm more excited than anything that if, as we look at this, they don't have the regulatory hurdles that they had to be able to pull this off. And I think it's going to be something that, I, I, like he said, you know, people may want this definitely in their backyard because it creates jobs and it creates opportunities. So exciting stuff. I think it's kind of cool, but it's something I've been talking about for a long, long time. And as an eternal optimist, it's always good to hear that you're, <laughs> you're on to something. You're listening to The Investor Coaching Show right here. I am Paul Winkler. <laughs> 